Good morning and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee for 2019. I can ask that all mobile devices are switched off and put away, please. Agenda item one is a decision to take agenda item three in private, um, which is discussion of our work programme. Do the committee agree? Thank you. Agenda item two is stage two consideration of the Children Equal Protection from Assault Scotland Bill. I welcome John Finney, member in charge of the bill. Marie Todd, Minister for Children and Young People. We're also joined by Adam Tompkins and Liam Kerr. You're all very welcome. Everyone should have with them a copy of the bill as introduced, the marshalled list of amendments that was published on Monday, and the groupings of amendments which sets out the amendments in the order in which they'll be debated. <coughs> Yes. Commissioner, I lodged two amendments uh, to this bill, which, um, as I understand it, you decided not to select. For the reason I was the only reason I've been given is that they, you took the decision that those amendments were inadmissible, but you didn't give reasons as to why you think those amendments are inadmissible. Could could you t okay. explain why my amendments were ruled to be inadmissible? Okay. Thanks for that point of uh, clarification, Mr. Tompkins. Standing Order Rule 9.10.4 states that it's for the convener of a committee to determine any dispute as to whether an amendment of which the clerk has been given notice is admissible. Standing Order 9.10.5 sets out the criteria for admissibility and Part 4 of the guidance on public bills. Two of the criteria are that an amendment must be consistent with the general principles of the bill and must be relevant to the bill. After looking carefully at the proposed amendments, I did not consider that they met these criteria. I therefore considered them to be inadmissible. It's a matter for the presiding officer to rule on admissibility at stage three. Can I, can I, can I respond to that with a further can, point briefly. of clarification? I'm very, I'm very grateful for that explanation, which I, which I understand, but I don't understand the reason why these amendments were deemed to be contrary to the general principles of the bill. The general principles of the bill set out in a policy um, uh, memorandum uh, published when the bill was published say that the purpose of the bill is to help bring an end to the physical punishment of children. And that was a view that was um, uh, um, endorsed and agreed with by this committee in its stage one report, paragraph four of which says that the bill's purpose is to discourage the use of physical punishment. So the phrase physical punishment appears in both paragraph four of the policy memorandum and in paragraph four of this committee's stage one report. My amendments were designed to ensure that assault for the purposes of section one of this bill means and means only physical attack. At the moment in, the, in Scots law, assault, you do not have to um, physically attack anyone in order to assault them. So this bill criminalizes the behavior of parents and carers and guardians of children, which the proponents of this bill and which this committee say are not intended to be criminalized. And my amendments were seeking to give clarity to the meaning of the word assault for the purposes of this bill, so as to achieve precisely the policy objective set out at paragraph four of the policy memorandum. So that, that's the reason why I don't understand with respect convener, how those amendments could be ruled to be contrary to the general principles of the bill. It's a long-standing convention, Mr. Tompkins, that the presiding officer or conveners do not give explanations on their decisions um, on admissibility. To be helpful, however, um, I note that there are a number of amendments before us today, and these give the opportunity for mm -hmm. members to debate in full the issues raised by the bill, and amendments ruled inadmissible at stage two can, of course, be submitted at stage three, where it's for the presiding officer to determine admissibility. And I consider the matter now closed, and we'll move on with the meeting. There will be one debate on each group of amendments. I will call the member who lodged the first amendment in that group to speak to and move that amendment and to speak to, a move, uh, and to, speak to all other amendments in the group. Members who have not lodged amendments in the group but who wish to speak should indicate that by catching my attention in the usual way. I would ask that anyone doing so um, be succinct and make sure that their contributions are relevant to the amendment or amendments being debated. I'd remind members this stage is not a rehearsal of arguments about the general principles of the bill. Members will be able to comment again on the merits or otherwise of this bill at stage three debate in the chamber. Standing orders give both the member in charge of a bill and any Scottish minister the right to speak on any amendment. I will therefore invite the minister and then John Finney to contribute to the debate just before I move to the winding up speech. <coughs> The debate on the group will be concluded by me inviting the member who moved the first amendment in the group to wind up. <clears throat> Following debate on each group, I will check whether the member who moved the first amendment in the group wishes to press it to a vote or withdraw it. If they wish to press ahead, I will put the question on that amendment. 
If a member wishes to withdraw their amendment after it has been moved, they must seek the committee's agreement to do so. If any committee member objects, the committee immediately moves to vote on the amendment. If any member does not want to move their amendment when called, they should say not moved. Please note that any other MSP may move such an amendment. If no one moves the amendment, I will immediately call the next amendment on the marshalled list. Only committee members are allowed to vote. Voting in any division is by a show of hands. It's important that members keep their hands clearly raised until the clerk has recorded the vote. The committee is required to indicate formally that it's considered and agreed each section and schedule of the bill. And so I will put a question on each section at the appropriate point. And I call amendment one in the name of Oliver Mundell and a group on its own, Oliver Mundell, to speak to and move amendment one, please. Thank you, uh, convener. Amendment one is designed to be a simple amendment uh, trying to draw together some of the points of consensus uh, that did emerge during the stage one evidence and to try and give some reassurance, uh, both uh, parliamentary and public, uh, to uh, those who have continuing concerns about the bill. I'm particularly uh, grateful uh, to Mary Fee and Christine Graham uh, for their support uh, in the amendment. And I have spent a considerable amount of time speaking to uh, other members uh, and uh, to uh, interested stakeholders in trying to, to bring this amendment together to capture, uh, in part, some of the uh, practice uh, that we've seen in both Ireland uh, and New Zealand, uh, which were both examples which came up frequently uh, through evidence <coughs> at stage one. Um, I am aware, uh, having uh, submitted the amendment, and there was uh, some considerable difficulty in trying to find a form of words uh, that fell uh, within the clerk's uh, view uh, of the scope uh, of, 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 of the bill. Uh, but I'm concerned myself uh, with uh, one uh, CII, uh, because I do think uh, there, th there is a legitimate point uh, around whether or not uh, there is an existing uh, parental uh, responsibility uh, to, as explicit as preventing a child from committing an offen a criminal offence. Um, and I think that that's something I would certainly want to to revisit in the drafting uh, of the amendment is something that's come to light uh, since, since its submission. And I think there's certainly uh, other areas of the language which, which could potentially be, be tightened up. Uh, so I, I guess at this stage, uh, I'm interested to hear uh, other members' uh, thoughts um, on, on the amendment. Um, and I'm not necessarily minded uh, to, to press it uh, myself at this stage, but interested in, in uh, hearing uh, views uh, and trying to uh, build some consensus, at least around uh, the principles that the best interests of the child should be taken into account, uh, that uh, there is ongoing issues around uh, restraint uh, and uh, that uh, there are recognised parental responsibilities uh, when it comes to maintaining a child's safety and wellbeing. Thank you. Um, Gail Ross. <clears throat> Thank you, and um, good morning um, to everyone. Thank you for coming. I've got a couple of questions, and one of them was actually on the line of to prevent the child from committing a criminal offence. I was just really looking for more clarity on what that actually meant. Um, I think that all the evidence that we took, or m most of the evidence, sorry, um, that we took, said that the removal of the defence would provide clarity in the law. And I feel that this amendment is uncertain because I think that it takes that clarity away again. Um, I have also um, want to ask about the restraint element, the physical contact with the child. Does that include forms of physical punishment or is it purely restraint? And um, the, the, I mean, the parents protecting children, we took a lot of evidence um, that said that the bill would not affect the ability of parents to protect their children. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested to sure, Yes, of course. I, sorry. I, I think on, the, on that particular point, I, it, it, this is a for avoidance of doubt clause, so it doesn't, it doesn't change the law. Um, as, as a sort of matter matter of fact, it, it, it's, it doesn't change what's already in the bill. It just provides you know, some reassurance. It, it's not designed to, to sort of supersede what sits above it. Okay. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm willing to look at the wording uh, of the amendment and, and potentially bring it back at stage three to, to make that clearer. Okay. 
Um, thanks for that, and, and um, I'm interested to hear Oliver Mundell say that you know he might look at the word inconvenience. So I'm happy with that. Thanks, Mary Fee. Thank you, um, convener, and good morning, um, everyone. Um, I just want to say a few brief words in support of this um, amendment by um, Oliver Mundell. I think the amendment reflects the concerns that we heard from a number of witnesses throughout the evidence sessions around the removal of um, their ability to um, use parental responsibility to protect um, th th their child. And, and as such, this amendment reflects that, and it would go a long way to allaying some of the, the concerns that were raised throughout the evidence sessions. And for that reason, um, I'm happy to support it. OK, Alex go Hamilton and then Fulton. Um, thank you, convener. Um, and can I start by thanking the member for reaching out to opposition members in discussions of potential amendments around stage two. I'm uh, sorry to say I can't support this, and, and I will begin to unpack why. Um, one of the words that we have heard consistently throughout the stage one proceedings is clarity and the need for clarity, and the fact that the landscape around physical punishment in Scotland is not clear. A, a great deal, a, a large number of members of the public believe that um, it is already illegal to physically punish your children, and are surprised when you tell them <coughs> it is not. The last time that the Scottish Parliament legislated on this was in 2003, and uh, only made the only sort of uh, strata or lands, uh, architecture around that was in the prohibition of headshots, shaking, um, and... Uh, use of implements. This bill is elegant because it, make, it draws a line under the equation. I think that the amendment uh, reverses that clarity that this bill affords. The member references... I will. Taking an intervention. I thought it was working. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. Um, the, the, the member says that the bill brings clarity as it is because it draws a line under the physical punishment of children. I think that's what the member just said. Does the member not accept that assault, which is the word that's used in section one of this bill, is not restricted to the physical punishment of children? And so what this bill, I'm sure, inadvertently does, I mean, it'd be interesting to know if it is deliberate, because it's not what the policy memorandum says, but I'm sure inadvertently, but nonetheless, what this bill does is it criminalizes actions with regard to children that go well beyond physical punishment. And that if the member is really seeking Clarity, and I believe that he, that he is, clarity in the law, particularly in the criminal law, is a, is a good thing. Let's all agree on that. Uh, that we need to clarify exactly what it is that we are seeking in this legislation to criminalise. And if we are seeking to criminalise physical punishment, then the bill needs to be amended to reflect that, because otherwise, and as it stands, it is not clear. I'm grateful for the intervention. I, I don't accept that premise at all. We're talking about the removal of a legal defence that used to also apply to the right of a, a man or a husband to physically punish his wife or his servants. This is about a cultural shift that we're talking about in Scotland. We're not talking about criminalisation of parents, as we heard um, through a range of witnesses that international examples of the 54 countries globally who've already taken this step do not see the mass criminalization of parents. So I, I, I fundamentally don't accept that premise. The member um, has offered parallels in his amendment to the legislation passed in New Zealand, but what, whether his amendment and the New Zealand legislation diverge is that in New Zealand it make, the law makes it explicitly clear that physical punishment is not in the child's best interest. I will. The, the, the member might be interested to know that I did try and lodge a version of this amendment with, with similar wording uh, to that, but I was told by uh, the legislative team uh, that they felt that the bill already uh, ruled out the possibility of physical punishment, therefore there was no need for it to be restated. Um, okay. So I, I, I don't know uh, what more I could do to, to satisfy his concerns, at, at, certainly at this stage. Okay, well, I'm very grateful uh, for the member's clarification on that point, um, and uh, that, that is very helpful. Um, when the member and I discussed potential stage two amendments. I'm, I'm very keen to, to foster consensus around this bill, so I was welcome to that approach. We talked about the best interest principle. The best interest principle um, is, is something that we should all agree on and is a, a creature of Scots law. It's a creature of international treaties as well, that, that in anything we do, um, be that in public policy development or in legal judgment, that we should always um, act with the best interest of children at heart. 
To that end, I expected an amendment to be forthcoming, which was more along the lines that, that at the point of referral by a social worker or a police officer, I, I won't at this, I, I will in a minute, but let me finish my point, that um, at the point of referral by police or by social work, um, that a best interest uh, judgment might be offered by Crown Office as whether it was in the best interest of the child to, to launch formal criminal proceedings against the parents. Um, I think that perhaps there could have been a, a constituency or a, a cross-stakeholder consensus built around that if you, if you needed that clarity within the bill. However, actually, um, as it's worded, I think it diminishes that clarity. It even almost suggests that if a parent were to argue that the physical punishment of their child was done in the best interest of the child, it might almost represent a quasi new legal defence. I also have an anxiety. Oh, I'll let you come in because you, you did want to come in there. Um, again, I just point the member to the fact that I did I did try that approach. And again, that was uh, a preferred approach uh, of mine um, in, in terms of a best interest test. But again, in terms of the scope of the bill, uh, I was told that it was too narrow and that the bill wasn't able to uh, give directions to courts or, or prosecutors. But again, given the member's support and interest in the matter, perhaps the presiding officer uh, we'll, we'll look at that um, in, at a later stage. That clarity also. Um, I, I think the final point I would say on this amendment, Convener, is uh, my anxiety as well as in addition to, um, to undermining the clarity that this bill affords to arguably reinstating a, a a nuanced route where a parent might justify their physical punishment of their child by reference to best interest. Um, I was slightly alarmed, and perhaps the, the member can offer clarity here, that in, <clears throat> in 1C um, there is in parenthesis the clause whether parental responsibilities or otherwise, to, sorry, fulfil the person's responsibilities, whether parental responsibilities or otherwise, and then linked to CII, to prevent the child from committing a, a criminal offence. That actually, I read that, that a, a law enforcement officer might uh, be swept up in that. And arguably, you might see a situation where, accidentally, we create a situation where it suddenly becomes OK for police officers to physically punish children in the streets. And, and I just wonder, had the member considered that as an unintended consequence of this amendment? Just before you come in, you will have the opportunity yeah. to wind up. So I wonder yeah, if we'll, we'll, we'll pick up these points in, in, in the winding up. Okay. So just so, uh, For all those reasons, uh, uh, Convener, I'm afraid I just can't support this amendment. Do you still need to come in, Fulton? Uh, um, I, I think that, that Gail Ross and Alex Cole Hamilton have, have kind of covered <coughs> um, the main points I was going to make. I do want to say that I think that the right uh, intention is behind this amendment, and I think following quite a, um, a heated stage one debate, I think uh, I want to commend uh, Oliver Mundell for doing that, and the fact that he's got the backing of, of Mary Fee for example, I think uh, demonstrates that. But <clears throat> I, I, I'm looking at the, the briefing here from Bernardo's Children's First NSPCC, who are the experts in this field and who have, um, who have you know, given us evidence throughout, um, throughout the, the stage one process. And they've got really grave concerns, like myself, with, uh, with this amendment. I, I'm not going to go over the points made by, by uh, Gail and Alex, but uh, you know, just to say I don't think that it brings clarity and I think that it's really concerning uh, that we could be in a situation where legally parents could be arguing that the physical punishment is in their child's best interest. So for those reasons, I'm not able to support this amendment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Minister, do you wish to come in? Thank you, Convener. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak for the Scottish Government in what's a very important debate for all children in Scotland. We can't support Amendment 1 for several reasons. First, the amendment purports to provide that nothing in Section 1 of the Bill affects the ability of a person having charge or care of a child to act in the best interests of the child. It's not clear from that exactly who would decide uh, whether or not the actions of a parent or carer are in the best interests of a child. Certainly. Um, I, I, I understand the point the Minister's uh, trying to make, but given the Bill refers to uh, the removal of a criminal defence, it's, it's, it's pretty clear to me uh, that these would be considerations for the court in the same way that they would be considerations uh, for, for the court uh, anyway uh, of the evidence we'd received from the, the Lord Advocate, and this would simply uh, seek to put the best interest of the child uh, onto the face of the bill. So, if the amendment is designed to provide that in certain circumstances, certain unspecified circumstances, a parent or carer could say that they used physical punishment because that was in the child's best interest, then that goes against the fundamental 
purpose of the bill, and that was already agreed at, at stage one by the whole parliament. Um, and the fund fundamental purpose of the bill is to give children equal protection from assault. In addition, Section 1 of the Children's Scotland Act 95 constitutes the central provision on parental responsibilities in Scots law and provides that parents have such responsibilities only insofar as compliance with this section is practicable and in the interests of the child. On that point, um, I thank the Minister for, for giving way again. And as I'd said to Alex Cole Hamilton again, uh, referencing the 1995 Act was something I had sought to do uh, in previous drafts of my amendment, but again, uh, the, the, the scope of the bill uh, made it difficult for me to, to refer to that. Um, and it's, it's something I would consider because I think that particular uh, section is well understood uh, in Scots law, it's well understood by practitioners, uh, by lawyers and other people. And I think, again, for me, uh, that might be a way of satisfying the best interest test and, and uh, parental responsibilities by referencing uh, that bill on the face of this. There's already... Um general provision on parents exercising their responsibilities in the interests of the child. The bill, as introduced, does not create any uncertainty or doubt in its impact or that, that, uh, on that and existing law that needs remedied. In fact, the bill doesn't impact on existing law beyond making it clear, importantly, I would say, that physical punishment can never be in a child's best interests. Paragraph B of the amendment uh, relates to restraint, and I appreciate that Mary Fee has taken a strong interest in restraint throughout the passage of the bill. The Scottish Government acknowledges the points made when the evidence was taken about the use of restraint in residential care and education settings. However, the Stage 1 report carefully considered these issues under the heading of restraint in the home. In paragraph 62, the report concluded that we do not agree physical punishment is required to protect children from harm. We conclude that the bill as drafted will not change a parent or carer's ability to restrain a child to keep him or her from harm. The Scottish Government agrees with this comment in the report, which is in line with the evidence received by the committee. We do not consider that the bill stops parents from using restraint to protect children from harm. As the Crown Office made clear, such restraint would lack the criminal intent which is needed to commit the crime of assault in Scots law. As a result, we consider this limb of the amendment to be unnecessary. Paragraph B would also create uncertainty by referring to the parent or carer making physical contact with the child. It's not clear whether this could include forms of physical punishment. If it could, that again goes completely against what the bill is doing and what the Parliament has agreed. Paragraph C of the amendment refers to fulfilling a person's responsibilities for maintaining a child's safety and well-being and for preventing a child from committing an, a criminal offence. But a fundamental argument for the bill is that physical punishment has a negative impact on children's welfare. The proposed amendment could be read as meaning that physical punishment could be used to maintain a, ch a child's well-being, and I reject that approach. With regard to preventing the child from committing a criminal offence, I would reject the idea that physical punishment is the way, for example, to stop a child from stealing. A better approach would be to separate the child from the property and to tell the child that stealing is wrong. The evidence shows that physical punishment is not just harmful, it's ineffective. All in all, far from removing you know, the avoidance of doubt, I believe this amendment introduces ambiguity and creates doubt and removes from the clarity of the law. So for all of these reasons, I invite Oliver Mundell not to press Amendment 1, but if it is pressed, I urge the committee to reject it. John Finney, do you wish to come in? Thank, thank you, convener. Good morning, members. Um, um, in his amendment, Mr Mundell uh, begins with the, and I quote here, for the avoidance of doubt. But I would seriously question and ask committee members to reflect if there is actually any doubt here. I'm not convinced that taken together the evidence the committee heard can be taken to mean the bill as drafted leaves any doubt. In which case, uh, the provision is liable to do more harm than good by adding in, ad in additional material that could cause difficulties of interpretation and hamper... Yes, indeed. I thank the member uh, for, for giving way. Uh, does he recognise that the fact the Lord Advocate addressed is going to address a number of these points in guidance? 
uh, suggests that there is at least uh, the, there is at least some doubt around how the public interest test would work, and that far from creating new provisions, these would simply um, I, I accept there's some problems with them, but in principle, these would simply take uh, the considerations that are going to be made by prosecutors and courts and move them forward in the process by putting them on the face of the bill. Uh, no, I don't accept that. I'm coming on to talk about the Lord Advocate, but I would say that it's standard practice for the Lord Advocate to give the, the police uh, guidance in respect of various issues. We know that in relation to emerging legislation we've had in recent times. So there'd be nothing different in that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, um, it's hard to see how you could apply the additional tests set out in the amendment in a consistent manner, given how vague and subjective they are. Evidence the committee heard from the Lord Advocate, Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service, Law Society, Police and Social Work all stated the bill, as drafted, would simplify the legal position. The amendment, therefore, is likely to have the reverse effect to that, indeed to introduce doubt rather than to dispel any doubt. For example, what would constitute the best interests of the child? How would physical strength be judged and assessed? And what would the breadth be of preventing a child from committing a criminal offence? The committee heard plenty of evidence which did not support the inclusion of such things on the face of the bill. The committee heard that prosecutors will continue to consider the best interests of the child as part of the public interest test and that mat relevant matters are already included in the prosecution code as matters that would be taken into account when investigating and prosecuting any case of assault on a child. In terms of B and C, attempting to clarify various examples of physical contact and responsibilities, I do not consider it necessary to set these matters out in the face of the bill, as the established common law of assault would apply, bringing with it consideration of the requisite criminal intent, along with the facts and circumstances of any individual case. These provisions also uh, raise issues relevant to the prosecutorial code, guidance, uh, etc., and therefore the defence in which is being abolished would not come into play. Again, this could confuse rather than clarify matters. The Lord Advocate told the committee, uh, and it's quite a lengthy quote, but so I, I'll, I'll summarise it. Um, can we there? It was about the prosecution code, the fact that it is a public document. Um, it includes comments about the, and I will quote this bit, uh, the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim, the age, background and personal circumstance of the accused and the victim, and the motive for the crime. Um, the code uh, sets out more detail under each of the public interest factors that are identified. Those factors will apply in relation to any report of any crime. Pro prosecutors are well used to applying them, and they do so currently when cases involving alleged assaults by parents and children are brought to their attention. Specifically in re response to a question from uh, Mr Mandel, the Lord Advocate said, uh, about, uh, uh, said, and I quote here, the premise of your question is that the law of assault is unclear. But I would point out that it is applied daily by police officers and prosecutors. There is not a problem with the clarity of the law. At the same time, though, a case could be made that removing the defence with the qualification that currently applies would increase that clarity. Uh, I'll conclude, Convener, by reiterating that Amendment 1 addresses the issues of permissible physical restraint of a child, apparently in connection with their safety and preventing self-harm. That is not the focus of the bill. This is about equal protection. Uh, the focus of the bill, which is dealing with the use of force against a child in punishment. There's no policy intention to legislate on the circumstances around permissible physical restraint of a child or adults in the bill. And I would ask the committee members to reject Amendment 1 in the name of Oliver Mundell. Thank you. Okay, um, Oliver Mundell, to wind up and press or withdraw um, Amendment uh, 1. Th th thank, you, thank you, Convener. I think that has been a, a helpful discussion, at, at least in part, because that... I, I, I don't accept. Uh, I don't accept uh, that the bill, as, as currently drafted, uh, is free from doubt. I, I think there are uh, legitimate and ongoing uh, concerns, and I'm concerned about the, the suggestion that somehow it's prosecution code that sets uh, the law of the land in this country. It's not. Um, it's, it's, it's what's in statute, and then how, how that is interpreted by the courts. And I think it, it, it's difficult to see. Not, notwithstanding the issues around the particular wording of the amendment at the moment, uh, how anybody could object uh, to the best interests of the child being taken into consideration. And I don't think anyone is objecting to that. So I don't see uh, what, 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 what possible issue that uh, it being on the face of the bill uh, raises. And, and secondly, I'm concerned, you know, when always when, when ministers and others... Uh, 
Yeah, certainly. Uh, for taking the intervention. Um, nobody would disagree with his statement that, that we would all agree that the best interests of the child are paramount and that we should take them into account. But in a way, this amendment twists that slightly to suggest that um, nothing in, the, in this section affects the ability for the person having char charge or care of a child to act in the best interest of the child, almost implying that occasionally an, a, a level of physical intervention with that child might be in that child's best interest. And that is, flies in the face of any sort of legal definition of what best interest for, for children might mean. And I, and I think the, the I, without, without being offensive, the, the clumsy wording the members just used do, does sum up my point, uh, because I think there are occasions when physical intervention can be in the best interest of the child. I think it's harder, um, and you know, I'm, I'm not seeking, uh, having accepted the decision of the Parliament at stage one to say that physical punishment is in the best interest of the child, but I think there are situations in which physical intervention is, uh, and it's trying to... It, sorry, for, 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 yeah. can, can just, I'm getting a bit confused now, sorry. Oliver, can you explain to me the difference between a physical intervention and a physical punishment? So, uh, physical intervention might be forceful restraint. Uh, for, exa for example, you know, hold, hold, holding, holding a child's arm uh, back, that, that, that happens regularly, and that... What's difficult in the case of this bill, and the point uh, I've been trying to get to right from the start, is the law of assault, uh, as, the, as, the, as the Crown uh, Office and Procurator for School Service confirmed in their written evidence, is, is a broad offence. It's something uh, Pamela Ferguson from the University of Dundee, uh, a chair uh, of Scots Law, uh, someone who's worked for the Law Commission, who's drafted... Uh, yes, certainly. So, we do not consider that the bill stops parents from using restraint to protect children from harm. As I said, as the Crown Office made clear, such restraint lacks criminal intent, which is needed to commit the crime of assault in Scots law. The Minister be able to clarify for me then when criminal intentions are, are considered in, in our legal process? <coughs> when, when, when does that question arise? At what point in the process? So, uh, the law around assault is absolute... As I said, what... Sorry. I would just remind you... Sorry. You're winding up here. You're, the the okay. minister's not given a speech, so. I'll, I'll let you intervene again to clarify, Minister, when in our legal process in Scotland uh, the, the issue of, of, of criminal intent uh, comes up. So, the question around the Scottish Prosecution Code, which is a publicly available document, as uh, John Finney uh, said, takes into account a number of things the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim, the age and background and personal circumstances of the accused and the motive for the crime. So by, by the time something gets to, to prosecutors to decide whether to prosecute, uh, people have already been subject to a criminal investigation uh, and, and could be subject to criminal allegations. And what I would want to be very clear, and that's what, for the avoidance of doubt, uh, was about and where this comes from, I would want to be very clear uh, that, that people exercising uh, their parental rights that exist in, in, in uh, both common law uh, and in other statute uh, you know, wouldn't be confused with assault, uh, because assault can be anything from, from shouting aggressively at someone, uh, you know, acting in a threatening manner. Um, th th those, those things are quite subjective, and I, I don't deny that there's clarity around the law of assault. I just believe it's a very wide uh, category of behaviour to be, to be mixing with the concept of physical punishment. And I think the, the, the issue for me here um, you know, is, trying to, is trying to draw the, those distinctions up front uh, so that it's clear to members of the public, uh, to, to uh, police officers, to social workers, to people who are not, uh, with, with due respect, looking at the prosecutorial code, uh, what, what, what is and isn't considered uh, to be behaviour that would be relevant uh, to what the purpose of this bill is. Can I ask you to, um, I, th I think we want to have full debate on everything, we're 35 minutes in now, so I think we've given this quite a good airing, if, you, if you're able to draw your I'll remarks to a close. I'll, I'll draw my remarks to a close, uh, convener. I, I think there's, in, in, in addition to that point, uh, you know, there really, um, th there isn't a, a lot else to say. Um, I don't intend to push the amendment at this stage because I recognise there are issues uh, with, with its wording, uh, and I would uh, hope that other members of the committee would afford me the opportunity to explore that further uh, and, and, and bring a, a new form of the amendment back at stage three. Okay, so just to be clear that you withdraw, you wish to withdraw, and do members of the committee agree that this... Agreed. 
Okay, that's agreed that that amendment is withdrawn. And the question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 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 Yes. Just ask a point of clarification. Um, is, it, is it possible to, to say no in the sense that you don't? Because I, 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 I still have fundamental problems with section one. Um, and I just would wish to register yeah. that. Can have a division? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, OK, so there will be a division. The question is that section one be agreed to. Can members who agree uh, raise their hands, please? Okay. And those who disagree? There were five, uh, total five votes um, for and two against. Um, section one is agreed to. <clears throat> I now call amendment nine in the name of Liam Kerr in a group of its own. Liam Kerr to move and speak to amendment nine, please. Thank you, convener. Good morning. And I'm very grateful to the committee for giving me the opportunity to speak to this amendment. Members of the committee will be well aware of my views on smacking. Uh, I do not believe it's in the interest of the child and I do not resile from that position at all. Uh, convener, I do, however, have serious concerns with the implications of this bill and the possible unintended consequences, particularly having listened to Mr Mundell's uh, comments there, which I thought were well made. I, and, and I suspect members of the committee, do not want to see good parents criminalised, nor subject to the, the might of the state for inadvertent transgressions. And I think that's a particular risk where there is ignorance of the law. Now, I acknowledge that the bill currently makes provision for raising awareness of the change in the law at Clause 2, but it's my view that that is not strong enough. Uh, it's my view that could be a missed opportunity if left as is. It is my view that we should take this opportunity to raise awareness of those parenting practices and alternatives to smacking that I have no doubt everyone on this committee would wish to see. So my amendment reflects that view that it is imperative that people know and understand the limitations placed on their behaviour, not only to promote the culture change that I think was referred to earlier on in the debate today, but also so that they do not inadvertently fall to be criminalised. So to that end, my amendment mandates the government to promote awareness of inter alia, the existing protections that children have from assaults, the rights and responsibilities of a parent and good parenting practices, including alternatives to any form of violence or smacking. Kavina, my view is our goal should be to help parents provide the best environment for their children by furnishing them with the, the parents with the knowledge and understanding that they need to do so. That is what my amendment seeks to deliver, and I very much hope this committee will support me in this. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Convener. I have some sympathy with uh, what the member is trying to do with this amendment. Um, however, I don't think it is something for primary legislation, uh, but more for guidance around implementation. Um, we, we've lent a lot on uh, international examples of the 54 countries who have gone before us in this regard, and I, I remind members of uh, the very powerful um, testimony of former Irish Senator Gillian Van Turnhout, who uh, told us that when she uh, got her amendment through uh, the Doyle um, which saw the end of physical punishment in Ireland. It was just an amendment to a bill. There was no budget attached to it. It had nothing attached to it. Um, and yet it, it worked. Um, and parents changed. They understood that there were, um, where the legal position was made clear and they just had to adopt different strategies for parenting. So um, I don't think this is something we need to legislate for on the face of the bill. Not least because I think, and I, I'm sure this is not the member's intention, but there are some... Um, uh, lacks, uh, this lacks definition. I think there are references to terms in this, for example, good parenting practice. When you set and st make a statement like that on the face of the bill, it demands a, cor a corollary 
of a clarification of what is meant by good parenting practice. And then we run the risk then of attaching in primary legislation pages and pages and pages of uh, academic text as to what we mean by good parenting practice. So um, whilst I understand the intent, and it is a good intent uh, from Liam Kerr, I, I won't be supporting it because I just don't think the face of the bill is the place for this. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, thanks, Camilla. And again, I do think that, that, that William Kerr comes uh, with the right uh, intention um, behind this. I think that what he's probably trying to do is allay fears, um, the, the, the biggest fear that, that, that folk um, out there have got and who, who have raised with us that there would be unnecessary criminalisation. But I would say to uh, William Kerr that if he'd sat through the if he'd been on the committee, like the committee members, and we, we got a lot of evidence and a lot of reassurance on that, um, you know, that, that, that actually in terms of the processes that are already in place uh, through child protection processes, that the, the risk of um, unnecessary criminalisation is extremely low. Um, and I think that the, the, the amendment that is therefore unnecessary and doesn't allow the scope that Alex Cole Hamilton talked about you know, we did hear from the Irish model that they actually didn't need a lot of publication um, around it. An intervention? Yeah. Just on that point, it, it, the, the, the question I'd throw back to you, Mr McGregor, is what if you're wrong? What if the risk of criminalisation isn't in fact low? Uh, and surely we must take this opportunity to make sure that we reduce that risk as far as possible and not leave it open to chance. Well, I... I'd I think the, the member for the intervention. I don't think that um, the amendment would have that effect. And I think what well, well, can I finish the answer? Like to finish your, your answer. Um, I, I will in a second. Um, I, I don't. I don't think that the the amendment would have that effect. And actually, we've got to we've got to base legislation on what we're hearing. And the evidence that we heard was overwhelming uh, in in this regard. And I think that you know I'm satisfied as a committee member that um, the risk of criminalisation unnecessarily uh, is, uh, is very low. I'll take Alex mm. Cole-Hamlin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, rather impetuous of me. Uh, grateful for the member taking the intervention. Does the member agree that, um, that there's no risk that people will not understand that um, physically punishing your child is now an offence because it is written in 80-foot technicolour neon sign letters by every group that opposes this bill every time it is brought up in, in the public domain. Yeah, and it also comes back to the point that we talked about a lot, we've talked about a lot in this committee that it is already an offence. This is, yes. bill is a, a, a removal of a... Well. Okay. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a relatively friendly one. I, I, I would just ask uh, the member you know, from his experience of uh, before coming into this place whether he does recognise uh, the, the challenges many parents face um, and that sharing best practice and advice uh, may, may, be, may be helpful for some people uh, because I, I think there are very few people uh, who, who set out uh, to, to, to deliberately uh, cause harm to their own children. Uh, but there are people, and we've heard it in evidence, uh, I've, I've certainly heard it uh, in the interactions I've had around the bill, that there are people uh, who, who have, uh, for want of a better word, resorted to smacking uh, because they've struggled to cope. Does he recognise there might be a role uh, for, for, for further guidance around uh, good parenting practices? I, I do recognise that, but uh, as I've consistently said um, through stage one, as of many uh, other members and um, agencies that we've heard from, this bill doesn't change that. I've got great faith in the agencies and the, the child protection process that we've got in place. And um, actually this bill has allowed for a conversation to uh, around how we support families who are struggling, and I don't think anything in this changes that, but I do accept Oliver Mundell's point. I can't, I can't be supporting, I can't support the amendment. Uh, Minister. Convener, uh, this amendment relates to the duty in section 2 on the Scottish ministers to raise awareness. The amendment would lay down a list of areas to be covered by this duty. Um, I, I have to say to Liam Kerr that the list of areas is slightly illogical. It includes the rule of law, the defence of reasonable chastisement, which would be repealed by this bill. It also refers to section 51 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2003 on physical punishment of children, which would also be repealed by this bill. So why would ministers promote the old law which is being repealed? In addition, I'm uncertain why there's a reference in the amendment to parental responsibilities under the Children in Scotland, Children Scotland Act 1995. The 1995 Act does make 
detailed provision on parental responsibilities. But as mentioned in the previous debate on, on, on the previous grouping, these are not being changed by this bill. I'm also concerned that the proposal, um, about the proposal that the Scottish Government is to be required to produce formal statutory guidance on good parenting practice. Our message has always been that we want to support mothers and fathers, not dictate to them how to be good parents. But I do agree that providing support for parents includes raising awareness on positive parenting practices, which do not include physical punishment. We already provide this kind of information through public resources, and we'll work with key partners and stakeholders to build on this as required by the bill. Part of the aim has to be to support families to try to prevent or to reduce flashpoints so that interventions are not needed at all. Now, that might not always be possible, but it's a reasonable objective. The Scottish Government recognises the need for public awareness and will comply with Section 2 of the Bill. When doing this, we'll consult with our implementation group and take account of points made by the committee in the Stage 1 report. However, Amendment 9 seems to lay down requirements that, given the fundamental purpose of the bill, would hinder rather than help awareness raising. If Mr Kerr has concerns about what the public information in this area might focus on, I'm more than happy to meet him. He's welcome to contact my office to make arrangements for this. I would therefore invite Leon Kerr not to press Amendment 9, but if it is pressed, I urge the committee to reject it. Uh, John Finney, do you wish to comment? Yes, thank you, Convener. Um, whilst I appreciate what I believe is uh, Mr Kerr's intention in moving this amendment, I'm afraid it's not clear how this amendment would affect Section 2 exactly. Section 2, as drafted, requires the Scottish Ministers take steps they consider appropriate to raise awareness and understanding about the effect of Section 1 of the Bill. This is drafted so as to allow the Government to determine what awareness raising steps would be appropriate. The same would apply to the list added by the amendment, if passed. The amendment would only require the Scottish Government to promote public awareness and understanding of those uh, things to the extent that it considers appropriate, um, which of course could be uh, not at all. Um, the inclusion of two of the points is unnecessary. Since the rule of law is being abolished and the relevant provisions of the 2003 Act being repealed, what is the point in either promoting those things or in promoting public awareness or understanding of them? The extent that these two points need to be explained, that's for the purpose of promoting the, what the Bill does, is already covered by Section 2. Section 1 of the Bill abolishes the rule of law, common law, provisions, and explains what the rule of law is. Further explanation can be found in paragraph 6 of the explanatory notes, Section uh, six, uh, 51 of the 2003 Act. I therefore do not consider it to be necessary to require the government to promote awareness and understanding of these things or to promote them in any other way, as ministers already have a requirement to explain Section 1 of the Bill, which abolishes and repeals them. The other factors that amendment requires the government to promote awareness and understanding of uh, cover areas which the government already provides information to parents about, uh, including the 1995 Act, which uh, informs Scottish Government policy on relevant matters and will alter uh, to reflect the new legislation. And therefore, and, and, and again, I don't consider it necessary to have it in the face of the bill. Moreover, concepts, as has been said previously, concepts such as good parenting practice, disproportionate violence or assault. Does a member have an exa example of proportionate assault or alternative and alternative parenting practices lack definition? I ask committee members to vote against Amendment, Care in the, uh, Amendment 9 in the name of Liam Kerr. Liam Kerr to wind up and impress or withdraw Amendment 9, please. Thank you, Convener. I'm grateful to the members and the Minister for her comments. Uh, just to respond to a few of the comments, just taking it from the top, Alex Cole Hamilton talks about uh, that this is not for, for primary legislation. It, it rather strikes me that if a weak mandate at Clause 2 is suitable, why wouldn't you go further? John Finney made the exact point. Uh, this could be not at all. Um, which is exactly the problem here. The government could decide to do nothing, uh, which would concern me, because then, as we've seen, you would have uh, a level of ignorance of what's changed and people inadvertently being criminalised in the way that Oliver Mundell brought out. And it, it feeds into a wider concern uh, that we leave too much to 
ambiguity. If, if Alex Cole Hamilton is right that good parenting practice is ambiguous, then what are, quote, such steps as appropriate to promote awareness? That doesn't mean anything. Uh, if good parenting practice doesn't mean anything, neither does what's in the bill currently. Yeah, go ahead. Grateful for Liam Kerr taking an intervention. Um, I think that actually uh, the, the legislation as drafted allows the flexibility for uh, ministers to respond and reflect um, the absolute cutting edge of good parenting practice. It doesn't limit them in any way, and I think we should welcome that. I, I would have had more sympathy with an amendment which perhaps had a duty on ministers to report to Parliament what, as to what steps they've taken, so that this couldn't just be left and we would revisit it. But as it is, I just think this is trying to write statutory guidance in primary legislation, which is never a good thing. I thank the member for, for the clarification. I wonder aloud, uh, I won't seek a response, but whether that suggests that he might vote for this amendment with a view to further amending it at stage three. Uh, which would be an opportunity open to him, of course. Uh, I'd like to turn to something that I heard Mr McGregor say, uh, <clears throat> because I think it's quite concerning on a, a wider level, not only in relation to my amendment. Uh, Phil McGregor accepted, uh, and, and I'll quote this, that there is a risk of unnecessary uh, criminalisation. There is some risk of unnecessary criminalisation. Surely the job of Parliament, Mr McGregor, is to reduce the risk of unnecessary criminalisation to zero. And we, as MSPs, must take all steps that we can to achieve that. This amendment is one part of that. And it seems to me that if, if, if Mr McGregor accepts that we must reduce the risk of unnecessary criminalisation to zero, if that's our job, then he must support my amendment. Yes, Mr Finney. I'm grateful for Mr Kerr taking the intervention. I know Mr Kerr wasn't present at the session, but is he aware of the evidence that the committee heard from Police Scotland and Social Work Scotland about how present arrangements work at the moment? And nothing would substantially change. Uh, I am aware of the evidence. I, I'm grateful to Mr Finney for, for coming in. It doesn't detract from my main point. We cannot, I, I cannot accept that if there is some risk, if people are watching this out there right now and saying, hang on, this, these MSPs are about to pass a bill that leaves me with some risk of, quote, unnecessary criminalisation. That's terrifying, Mr McGregor. I'll take the intervention. The reason why I'm intervening, uh, Mr Kerr, is I think you've deliberately misquoted, uh, or, or you've not misquoted me, but you've, you're, you're, not, um, you're not quoting me in the context. I've said it's perceived risk of, crimin of unnecessary criminalisation, that, and that's why I thought, think you've brought forward the amendment. We heard overwhelming evidence that that is unlikely to be the case. We heard overwhelming evidence that the procedures and the systems that we've got in place, particularly around child protection, are robust and strong and already deal with these situations every single day. So I, I, I don't accept the premise of your remarks towards me. And I think that this bill does not, uh, does not lead to a risk of unnecessary criminalisation. In fact, it strengthens the law around protecting children. I thank Mr McGregor. I think the official record will be revealing in this regard. I, I understand why he came back. I understand this. I, I am quoting his words back to him, but uh, Mr McGregor, it, it, it's, I'll, I'll move on, convener, it's fine. Uh, look, in summary, convener, failing to vote for this amendment, I think, will be a massive missed opportunity to reduce risk, to reassure parents, uh, because I don't think parents are going to look at the explanatory notes, Mr Finney, uh, reassure the public and make this a better bill. And I urge the committee to do that, to take that opportunity. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. OK, there will be a division. Those in favour of Amendment 9? Those against Amendment 9? There were two votes for the amendment, five against the amendment. Amendment 9 is disagreed to. The question is that section two be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Okay. A 
I call Amendment 2 in the name of Annie Wells, grouped with Amendment 3. Annie Wells to move Amendment 2 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, convener. Um, and I move both amendments in my name. My comments will be relatively short. Um, amendment 2, it's a clarifying amendment intended to make clear the rights of parents. Section 3.3 of the Bill states that Scottish ministers have may, by reg regulations, make such further transitional, transitory or saving provision as they consider necessary in connection to Section 1. For the avoidance of doubt, it should be made clear that anything introduced above and beyond the Bill will not inhibit parents' existing rights in accordance with Children's Scotland Act 1995. For example, the rights of a parent to prevent harm to their child, whether this being preventing a child running across a road or the need to administer life-saving medicine to a distressed child. Amendment 3 is also straightforward. The amendment um, is set to ensure that any changes should be subject to proper parliamentary procedure. Thank you. Um, Gail Ross, you wish to come in. Um, yeah, thank you, um, uh, convener. Um, I just have a, a, a couple of questions on this, and I think, I'm sorry, um, Annie, but I was uncertain as to what this Amendment 2 did when I read it. I'm even more uncertain now after your explanation about children um, running out into the road and administering medicine. And again, we've got this um, for the avoidance of doubt. In all the evidence, and I think we've said this more than once now, there is no doubt that the bill brings a clarification in law. And I'd, um, I'd, I, I want to also ask about um, the bit that says unduly limit the ability of parents to carry out their responsibilities to their children. Does this mean that if they so wished, they could bring a judicial review and argue that it was unlawful in some way? Or I, I, I think I just need a lot more explanation of what this is intended to do. Um, and as for um, amendment number three um, in your name, um, it is usual for the ancillary provision powers such as those in section 3.3 to be subject to the affirmative procedure um, when there is a power to amend primary legislation, but there is no such power here. Um, indeed, the powers are actually quite limited, so um, I will be uh, rejecting this, even though at first glance, I mean, it seems um, uh, quite straightforward, but it's actually not applicable to the bill, so I won't be uh, supporting that. Thanks. Minister. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak on amendments two and three. The Scottish Government does not consider amendment two to be necessary. The powers contained in section 3.3 of the bill relate to making regulations on transitional, transitory or saving provision in connection with the coming into force of section one. So far we've not identified any uh, need to use these powers. More fundamentally though, the powers at section 3.3 are quite limited and technical in nature. They just relate to the, the removal of the defence contained in section one of the bill. They're not about substantive parental responsibilities and rights as contained in part one of the Children Scotland Act 95. As a result, there is no doubt to be avoided here because regulations could not make substantive provision on the rights and responsibilities of parents. So amendment two is unnecessary. On that basis, um, I urge the committee to reject it. Amendment 3 relates to the parliamentary process to be followed when making regulations under Section 3.3. The regulation making power under Section 3.3 doesn't include um, power to amend primary legislation, which is when the affirmative procedure is typically appropriate. And I note as well that the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee were content with the Delegated Powers provision in the Bill. Um, I again invite uh, the committee to reject this amendment. John Finney. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I measure a duplication with the, the Minister here, I think. The explanatory notes and the delegated powers memorandum both clarify that the regula regulation making power in section 3, subsection 3, is technical and limited, and therefore that the negative procedure is considered to be the most appropriate. The delegated powers and law reform committee considered the DPM and had no comments to make. The delegated power is limited to, to um, quote, what is expedient or necessary in connection with coming, at the, coming into force of section 1. It's included in the bill to give Scottish uh, ministers flexibility should they identify any further 
transitional transitory or savings provisions that could not be anticipated when the bill was drafted. As such, I don't consider that there is any doubt, as referred to in Amendment 2, that the regulation-making power could in any way limit the ability of parents to carry out the responsibilities to their children. Perhaps the member could give an example in our summing up. Also, the new test set out is vague and subjective, particularly in relation to the inclusion of unduly, which we covered earlier, which implies this, that some limitation is legitimate, not least because a primary, a primary such responsibility is to protect uh, children from assault. The Minister on Evidence told the committee that she did not think the power would be used. Uh, regarding Amendment 3, as stated above, negative procedure is considered appropriate. Um, which is uh, for such transitional transitory and savings provisions, which is largely technical in nature and in any case is limited to what it could be considered necessary expedient in connection with the coming into the force of Section 1 of the Bill. So I ask members to reject uh, amendments 2 and 3 in the name of Annie Wells. Annie Wells to wind up and press or withdraw amendment. Thank you, Convener, and I thank members for their, their input. The point of amendment 2 that I was trying to make is it's not clear, it's not yet clear what transitional regulations could be of concern, because at the moment there isn't a lot of detail in these transitional regulations. And that's why I was putting the amendment forward. And also Amendment 3, it's not always to be the negative, it is the, the normal way, but given the sensitivity of this bill is the reason why I put forward the amendment, so that Parliament could scrutinise further any, any future um, any future um, transitional regulations. So on that basis, I am still going to move the amendment in my name, press amendment. Okay. Um, the, the, the question is that amendment to be agreed to, are we all agreed? No. no. Um, there'll be a division. Those in favour of amendment two? Okay. Those against amendment two? Two members for Amendment 2 and five against. The amendment is not agreed. I call Amendment 3 in the name of Annie Wells, already debated with Amendment 2. Annie Wells to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to indicate? And those against the amendment? There are two members for the amendment, five against. The amendment is not agreed to. The question is that section three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment four in the name of Oliver Mandel, grouped with amendments five and six. Oliver Mandel to move amendment four and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, these, again, uh, are a set of simple I. Uh, consensus building amendments trying to capture in guidance again the points uh, that have come up in the stage one evidence. I, I think it is important uh, that uh, not necessarily uh, on uh, the face of the bill uh, but that some of the points uh, that my colleague Liam Kerr raised in his amendment uh, could, could be captured uh, in, in some aspects of this guidance but I think it's important uh, that we do I ask the Scottish Government uh, to, to provide uh, guidance and, and information uh, that would be useful uh, to... to uh, yes. I'm grateful to Mr Mandel for taking the intervention. Um, and I, I, if I were a member of the committee, I would support um, this amendment. I think it's not really uh, necessary. I think it's essential to give clarity to the reasonable points of doubt that do exist with regard to this bill, notwithstanding the protestations to the contrary from, from some quarters. The, I, I note that the member's uh, amendment in... Um, uh, subsection 1C talks about guidance having to include guidance on the limits of physical force in 1C paragraph B. Um, does the member accept that the intention of the bill is not matched by the bill as currently drafted in, the, in that the clear intention of the bill, as we've heard repeatedly this morning, as we heard throughout the stage one debate a couple of weeks ago, um, and as Mr Finney makes clear in his policy memorandum, is to outlaw the physical 
punishment of children. That phrase, physical punishment, comes up over and again. I think both Mr Finney and the Minister have used it repeatedly uh, this morning. And that's not what the bill does. The bill goes further and potentially much further than that to criminalise the actions of parents, carers and guardians of children that are not physical punishment, but are other ways in which, as, the, as Scott's law is defined at the moment, may constitute an assault. Because the, the fatal flaw in this bill is to assume... I'll just pause you to remind you that we're not debating the bill in its entirety just now and just ask you to speak to the, the uh, amendments. Which are, to, I'm speaking, thank, you, thank you for giving a, happy to take that advice. I'm speaking directly, just for, the, for clarification, to the words in Mr Mundell's amendment that say, and I quote, guidance must include guidance on the use of physical force. I'm asking Mr Mundell to clarify what he understands by, by that in the, context, in the context of this bill. I'm speaking directly to those, to those, to those provisions. Um, uh, and that, um, that the, the, the mistake is to assume um, uh, that physical punishment and assault mean the same things when they don't. So for that reason, it is essential that guidance is provided in advance of this bill coming into force to make it clear whether or not it is intended to criminalise assaults against children which do not constitute physical punishment. Uh, I thank uh, Adam Tompkins uh, for that intervention, and I agree up to a point. Uh, I think it would be better to make that point on the face of the bill uh, you know, as, part of, as part of the legislation uh, it, itself. I think guidance is second best to that. And I think if... On that point? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, if, if, for the record, Mr Mandel, I mean, I did seek to bring amendments um, to this bill which would have uh, allowed a debate uh, on uh, this very issue so that these issues could have been clarified on the face of the bill. Um, but the, those amendments were ruled inadmissible, and we heard the convener this morning explain that she wasn't able to give reasons as to why those amendments were ruled inadmissible. So just that's, that's for the record. I, I, I thank Mr. Tompkins, uh, Professor Tompkins for that uh, explanation. Uh, I, I think there are other important points within this uh, guidance uh, as well. I think throughout the bill we've heard from uh, the minister, the member in charge, uh, and I think, uh, in, in fairness, from, from every member of the committee at some point or another, uh, that the bill wasn't seeking uh, to, 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 pro to prosecute uh, parents, uh, not seeking to, to, to criminalise them. Uh, and I, again, I think there is a duty uh, to, to, to make clear uh, to parents, to social workers, uh, to uh, charities, to, to organisations that work with children, to uh, individuals who are involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, aspects of children's life, what, what the alternatives are uh, to, to, to picking up the phone uh, I, you know, and going straight uh, down uh, the, the process of, of contacting the police, and I think uh, I, I, I think we should make that available. I'm particularly uh, exercised about uh, 4D as well, which also forms its own amendment um, at six, which is around the legal support and advice uh, that's available to children um, under uh, the 1995 Act. There is a parental uh, expectation uh, that, pa that and, and responsibility and that. that Parents have as acting as a as a legal, uh, acting uh, in a legal capacity for their children, and I think where uh, children's parents uh, are are subject to to an offence that in involves them uh, as as either victim or or a witness, they, they should be able to access uh, sort of legal advice and support. And, and, and yeah, Absolutely. certainly. Um, I'm grateful for the member giving way. Um, I, I understand what he says, uh, and I have some sympathy with the um, interests of children who have witnessed a, a crime. Um, can I ask why he didn't bring this forward as an amendment to the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill? Um, I, I have to say that was an, an oversight on my part. Um, I've, I've, I've heard uh, this argument earlier this week from, from children's charities as well, uh, but I never think the fact that something wasn't done in previous legislation is not a good reason for doing it now. And I think what's, what's drawn my attention in the case of this uh, is, is, is there's something slightly different here, and that's that the, the nature uh, of, of uh, removing the defence means that a category of behaviour that I think uh, wouldn't meet the public interest test in every case, or that where there's, and the, Crown, the Crown themselves say in their written submission to us that there is an area of behaviour uh, you know, where there's, there's very mild, where there's a very mild uh, force used uh, where difficult questions arise. And I think in those sort of cases, having access to legal advice or uh, the, the child having a chance to understand what the likelihood of success uh, of any action would be, um, 
and the opportunity to, to speak to family members to understand uh, what the impacts on the family would be maybe of going to uh, go, going through a legal process. I, I think it would be extra helpful uh, in this case to ensure that that advice is available. And I don't see uh, what harm it could do. And it would be it would be something that would be easily available to me uh, as an adult. You know, I, I could go out and, and pay uh, to, to to access legal advice. Uh, most, most adults could do that. Ch children don't always have that right, and particularly uh, where they're not being supported by their immediate parents. There are many children uh, in, in, in families with a single parent um, as well, and I, I think it can be it can be difficult. So I, I would like, uh, and I don't see what possible harm it could do, uh, to, to make many of the good advocacy services and lots of the things that we did discuss uh, during the Age of Criminal Responsibility Bill around advocacy uh, and legal support, why we couldn't make uh, that explicit in guidance. Um, and I, I, I would struggle to see how people would find that hard to disagree with. Um, I also uh, tried to capture, um, in terms of Lord Advocate's guidance, uh, what I was looking for. I recognise that that might be more difficult and uh, potentially creates uh, some, some questions. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so have you, did you consult the Lord Advocate about putting his guidance in, on the face of the bill? or Has is, is he given an opinion on that? I, he, he hasn't given an opinion on it, and I, I didn't seek one because I don't feel, as a parliamentarian, uh, that, that, that that's my role. And I think he, he operates separately to Parliament, which is what I was coming on to, uh, which I think does create some challenges as to whether it's appropriate uh, to, to, to direct him uh, in that way. Um, but I, I wanted to bring forward this particular amendment to, to emphasise uh, and, and at least have a discussion around what I felt was important and with particular reference to 1EA. Uh, I think uh, I want to see his guidance uh, cover uh, a person's responsibility to protect a child uh, who they're in charge of and how that interacts uh, with the removal of the defence, particularly in these cases where uh, there's a use of, of physical force uh, that, that isn't physical punishment, that's something different. Uh, but could, uh, to outside parties, uh, appear uh, to, to, to look the same. Uh, and I, th I think having some very clear uh, guidance uh, from uh, the minister or ministers around uh, force, uh, for uh, uh, for one CB uh, on common situations, because I think we all accept uh, and there's been a number of examples that, that come up and have come up in other countries. We all accept those are not things uh, that this, this, this legislation is designed to, to capture. Um, and I think it's, a, it's the same point really at 1EA, but I do accept uh, that members would take an individual judgment on whether it's appropriate, given the commitments we had from the Lord Advocate, to put uh, that on the face of the bill. Okay, thank you. There are a couple of committee members wishing to speak. Alex Cole Hamilton and then Mary Fee. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'll, I'll try to be brief. I, I'm going to speak against all of the amendments in this group, but particularly four and five. Um, with Amendment four, I strongly disagree with the premise um, on the, in the amendment that suggests an existence of parental rights in relation to the use of physical force. We rehearsed in every evidence session at stage one that there is no such right enshrined in international convention or treaty. Yes. I, I accept that he does, he's, he's saying that, but, but there is, in, in, Scots, in Scots law, there are clear cases where, uh, and, and, and the members set out some of those himself, picking up a child, uh, holding a child back, pulling a child's hand away. The, 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 their uses of physical force. Does a member I don't disagree that? that there's a right to restraint, but I, I think that we're perhaps getting into a semantic argument here, which is better suited to stage three uh, chamber debate. Um, however, physical force, uh, for me, suggests um, a punitive element, whereas uh, restraint does not. And I think that there's a very important distinction there. I think that, as such, this lends further confusion to an otherwise very clear bill. Um, I also uh, would go back to my point about uh, the the aspects of this amendment about those who, children who witness a criminal proceedings involving parent or guardian. I feel that actually strays beyond the scope of this bill and, uh, and w feels um, an aberration when it is uh, used in the, on the face of this bill in isolation and makes no reference to other bills which deal very specifically. Yes. Um, he, he might note uh, that at 1B of, of 4, uh, that any guidance would only be on the operation of this Act, 
So that might clarify that point. For that, but I, I still think it takes it beyond the scope of this bill. Secondly, on Amendment 5, uh, the, the Lord Advocate, when he gave oral evidence, very helpful oral evidence to this committee a couple of weeks ago, could not have been clearer that it is intention uh, to produce statutory guidance. I think it's frankly extraordinary that we as par parliamentarians should seek to compel um, a, a Lord Advocate towards the um, production of prosecutorial guidance when it's his job to do that. He's already said he's going to do that. He knows that this is one of the most sensitive bills that this parliament will pass in this session. And as such, I would expect it to be at the very top of his entry. I think it's, it's wholly unnecessary for us to start directing his work through primary legislation. So for that reason, Convener, I'm not going to support any amendments in this group. Lady Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. I wanted to speak in particular with relation to um, Amendment 6. Um, and, and on the face of it, there, there is no reason on first reading why I would not have um, sympathy for the, this amendment, given that it's asking for support for um, children and support for children in instances of arrest or criminal proceedings or prosecution is something that I have a great deal of sympathy with. I've done a considerable amount of work with um, families affected by imprisonment on the impact of prosecution on a, on a child and the long-term mental health impact that any um, interaction with um, criminal prosecution can have on a child. And I have often said in this chamber that children are the forgotten victims of crime because they are so often forgotten when a, an adult or a, a carer is arrested and removed from the home. What has slightly pulled me back from support um, for the, this, um, this amendment, and I have a, a deal of sympathy with the, the comments from Alex Cole Hamilton, that I think this goes beyond the scope of this, this bill, because support for children should be um, there regardless um, of whether it's specifically in relation to this bill. It should be in any matters of, of prosecution. Um, and I wonder if perhaps in winding up, if the member could, um, the, if Oliver Mundell could give some clarification, um, because I was slightly confused when he spoke about um, independent legal advice, because I come from a, a view of more emotional um, support on the way through um, prosecution. And if we're limiting it only to legal advice only in the instances of this bill um, I, I think we are we are missing an opportunity and it goes way beyond the, the scope of this bill okay minister the government does not support amendment four five and six um, firstly it's proposed that a Scottish minister provide guidance on the rights of a parents to use restraint Physical punishment is not needed to keep children from harm. The bill will not affect the ability of parents or carers to use restraint to stop a child from coming to harm. Information about the limits on the use of physical force could undercut the key aim of this bill to remove the reasonable chastisement defence. Any such information could simply be a guide to the use of force. To respond to the comments and the exchange between um, Oliver Mundell and Adam Tompkins, this bill is intended to give children equal protection from assault. The law on assault is clear. We heard evidence at stage <coughs> one that police officers apply and prosecutors apply it day and daily. There is no problem with the clarity of the law. In fact, this will increase the clarity of the law. Certainly. I'm grateful to the Minister for taking an intervention. At stage one, Minister, you said um, that at the heart of the defence, and these are words which I'm quoting from the official report, at the heart of the defence of reasonable chastisement is the concept that it can sometimes be reasonable to strike a child. And you said that the removal of the defence reflects the growing body of international evidence that shows that physical punishment of children is harmful and ineffective. That's all fine, right? But do you accept that this bill goes further than that and criminalises not merely striking a child, not merely the physical punishment of the child, but all assaults against children, whether they involve a physical attack or not. Do you accept that the law of assault is broader than that and that therefore it, that this bill as drafted brings into the ambit of the criminal law by removing that defence um, more than simply striking or physically punishing a child? So I do accept that the law of assault is broader I do accept that the law of assault includes an attack which puts the victim into a state of fear of immediate physical 
injury? Is the member saying and suggesting that it should be permissible for a parent to do that? If the, if the Minister will take another intervention, I'll, I'll respond to that. Uh, what, what I am saying is that the bill should reflect its policy objectives. The policy objective of this bill could not be clearer. The policy objective of this bill is to outlaw the physical punishment of children. Now, rightly or wrongly, inadvertently or deliberately, as drafted, this bill does that and then some. It does more than that. So what I am seeking in the interests of clarity, which I think is a cardinal value in criminal law, in the interest of clarity to amend the bill uh, or to urge that the bill be amended so that it accurately reflects what its, in its policy memorandum its stated ambition is. So as I've said already, the intention of this bill is to give equal protection from assault and the law of assault is perfectly clear in Scotland. It is prosecuted day in, day out. I think you're casting doubt where none exists. The amendment is not clear in what it um, refer means by the term common situations. For example, some children with autism can be oversensitive to touch and they experience pain differently. So rather than this amendment, I would raise a, our plan is to raise awareness in line with section two, taking account of children with special needs and other vulnerable children. That's consistent with what the committee said at stage one. Amendment four also proposes that the government issue guidance on best practice on alternative to prosecutions. This cuts across the constitutional independence of the Lord Advocate in the courts, and it wouldn't be appropriate for the Scottish Government to issue guidance that infringes on this independence, nor would it be appropriate for the Scottish Government to issue guidance that in establishing limits of force restricts the court's ability to take into account the particular facts and circumstances of each case. On issuing guidance for families, universal and targeted services and voluntary organisations already offer extensive support in this area. On Amendment 5, I'm concerned about the implications of this for the Lord Advocate's independence. Generally speaking, it is for him to independently determine prosecution policy and any guidelines he issues to Police Scotland. It is also generally a matter for the Lord Advocate to decide whether such guidance should or should not be published. In making that decision, I understand that he considers whether publication would be liable to prejudice the prevention or detection of crime. There's a clear risk that this guidance, if published, could be used as a guide to avoiding prosecution. It could also undermine the clarity the bill seeks to provide, certainly. Uh, can, I, can I ask the Minister why the Lord Advocate then committed to issuing similar guidance when he appeared before the committee? Uh, I, I can't speak for the Lord Advocate. I think it's perfectly appropriate. I mean, the Lord Advocate generally does issue guidance. I don't think that's an unusual thing for him to do. It doesn't go into the statute on the face of the bill, though. That would be unusual. A statutory duty in this term simply is not needed. The committee's heard from the Lord Advocate that he intends to issue guidance and that the approach to prosecutions will be informed by the state's responsibility to protect children from harm and by consideration of the best interests of the child. The committee also heard from the Lord Advocate about the two things that a prosecutor will consider when assessing the report of an alleged crime, whether there's credible evidence that a crime has been committed and if there is sufficient evidence, what action will be in the public interest? The Scottish Prosecution Code already sets out factors that may, depending on the circumstances, be relevant in assessing the public interest. Police Scotland have confirmed their intention to issue national training on the removal of the defence. Again, this clearly shows that Amendment 5 isn't needed. On Amendment 6, the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014 makes extensive provision for the rights of vulnerable witnesses, including children, and the support they're entitled to access. Similarly, provisions within the recent Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland 2019 Act provide for reforms relating to special measures for vulnerable witnesses, such as children in criminal cases, including the greater use of pre-recorded evidence at trial. There's no need for Amendment 6 and in potentially delaying the abolition of the defence, it makes the picture for children's rights worse, not better. 
Finally, these amendments state that Section 1 can't come into force until the publication duties have been complied with. Who's to say when this happens so that Section 1 comes into force? So for all of these reasons, I invite the committee to reject Amendments 4, 5 and 6. John Governor, uh, these amendments are seeking to make the Act's commencement conditional on the issuing of ministerial and prosecutorial guidance. Uh, the amendments are technically flawed and would not work as intended. The Bill's substantive provisions come into force automatically 12 months after Royal Assent, and none of these amendments as drafted would prevent that from happening. You can only meaningfully set preconditions on commencement if you have something, some timing flexibility in the first place, most obviously by having commencement by regulations and so by saying that the ministers may not bring into the act until they've done X, Y or Z. Um, in any of these amendments, if any of them were agreed to and some of the additional things listed hadn't been done by the 12-month deadline, there would be genuine uncertainty as to whether Section 1 was or was not in force, which would simply cause confusion in the law to no one's benefit, and this distracts from the clarity which the Bill aims to deliver. Turning to Amendment 4, it's not clear who the guidance referred to is directed at. Um, and what status is expected to have? Is the guidance meant for parents, the police, social workers, prosecutors? In all of these examples, the committee have been told the current guidance and or information, etc., will be provided or updated. The Scottish Government provides guidance and support to parents via a number of agencies, social work, health boards, etc. Police and prosecutorial guidance are a matter for the police, Lord Advocate and Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service. And information is already publicly available in the prosecution code, uh, including the public interest test. And uh, lots of, there's been lots of evidence to the, the committee on that. Amendment 6 appears to be a stripped-down alternative to Amendment 4, omitting paragraph, uh, subparagraphs A to C. Therefore, the same questions apply as those that were given under Amendment uh, 4 that I've referred to previously. Again, it's not clear who the guidance referred to is directed at and what status it's expected to have. Amendment 5 contains an inherent contradiction between issuing guidance and policy, uh, which must be in general terms, while at the same time ensuring that it's appropriate to the, quote, individual circumstances of individual cases. The committee heard clearly from Lord Advocate that guidance will be prepared and issued to Chief Constable. Indeed, he said, and I quote, if the bill is passed, I intend to issue Lord Advocate's guidelines to the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the investigation and reporting of allegations of assault by parents on children. He went on to say, I issue guidance, guidelines to the Chief Constable and it is then his responsibility to disseminate instructions to his officers on the ground. The Lord Advocate also set out details of the current publicly available prosecution code, which contains comment on the public interest test and how the best interests of the child are central, central to decision making. He told the committee these guidelines and prosecutorial policy will support a proportionate and appropriate response to the individual circumstances of particular cases. When appropriate, that response may include the use of informal response by the police, recorded police warnings, diversion and other alternatives to prosecution. At the same time, prosecution will be enabled when that is properly justified by reference to all the circumstances of the individual case. The approach will be informed by our responsibility to protect children from harm and by, importantly, my insertion of the word importantly, consideration of the best interests of the child. This amendment, therefore, seems to add no value to the work that the Lord Advocate has already confirmed is underway, and, and I would ask members to reject all the amendments in the group. Thank you. Oliver Mundell, to wind up and um, press or withdraw Amendment 4, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. I, again, I feel from my point of view that's been, been an interesting discussion. I am happy to, uh, in relation to, to guidance, I uh, clarify its status and its intended audience uh, in, in revised amendments at stage three um, and uh, to, to look at adding additional clarity uh, to, to some of the terms uh, within it. In, in terms of the issue around uh, commencement, I'm, I'm aware of that. Um, it's not, uh, it, it's, it's not, I'm not, it wasn't a condition I was really looking for. Uh, again, it was an issue in terms of how to uh, get these particular issues discussed. Uh, and to look at the possibility of guidance because there was nowhere else uh, where it easily fitted 
uh, into the bill, and I was advised this was, was the best way to do that. But again, you know, I'll look at the possibility of removing that wording uh, at, at a later stage. Um, in terms of uh, Mary Fee's uh, points, uh, I, I would say that, again, as I said to Alex Cole Hamilton, uh, this does just refer to the operation of this Act. Um, and secondly, at D, it's not limited uh, to independent uh, legal advice or contact with uh, a nearest relative or trusted adult. They're just two things uh, I, I feel strongly about. And the reason I feel independent legal advice is important in this case is because for these very marginal cases or difficult cases, I think uh, ch children sh should uh, be able to understand uh, the probability of success uh, of the court action uh, and, and how they wish to how they wish to, to, in, to, in, to interact with that and to, and to understand uh, what what their rights are um, and I, I think the nature of the relationship between a, a child and their parent uh, is a special one it's recognized as being legally uh, different uh, from other other relationships in law uh, and I think uh, you know, given the sensitivities around charges that are likely to come forward um, as a result of the defence going, I think it is really, really important. Um, and I can't say that you know, anything other than, uh, you know, I'm sorry I haven't pursued this in relation to, to other offences. Uh, but but I, I think it's an important point, full stop. In relation to Amendment 5, I, you know, I accept uh, the kind of consensus uh, view and I, I won't seek to, to push it. Uh, but I, I would, at this stage, like to move uh, four and six, and I think that they could uh, be tidied up in, in drafting or maybe moved to another section of the bill uh, at stage three. Okay. Are um, other members content that Amendment 5 not be pressed? Yes. yes. Okay. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. 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 Okay, there'll be a division. Those for the amendment? And those against the amendment. Two members for the amendment, five against the amendment falls. And to confirm, you are not pressing amendment five, and committee members are content for that to be withdrawn. Okay. Um, the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. Those for Amendment 6. Those against Amendment 6. Two for Amendment 6, five against the amendment falls. Call Amendment 7 in the name of Oliver Mundell and a group on its own. Oliver Mundell, to move and speak to Amendment 7, please. Hey, thank you, Convira. I don't intend uh, to speak for a long time to this amendment, as I don't imagine uh, off the previous debates it's likely uh, to, to get any support. Uh, the simple intention uh, was to ensure that bodies were, were properly resourced. I felt uh, that uh, off the Minister's letter there was still uh, some, some ongoing... Uh, un uncertainty um, on that point, and I think it is important uh, that uh, par Parliament uh, at least has, has a thought to this issue, and I know that there are other members uh, in, 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 who, who may take an interest in this matter uh, at, at stage three. Minister. Uh, convener, this amendment seems quite simply to be an attempt to delay this bill. Outside of the ordinary budget process, it would be very unusual for the Scottish <laughs> Government to have to provide a statement on the resources being provided to various bodies and for the Parliament to specifically approve this. In response to the Stage 1 report issued by this committee, the Scottish Government wrote to members of the implementation group to seek information about costs. We provided the committee with a letter outlining the results of our discussions with the implementation group and we'll have further discussions with members of the group. Resources required in relation to this bill will be one-off implementation costs and ongoing costs. It's not clear if the resources referred to in the amendment are intended to cover implementation costs or running costs or both. It's not clear for what time period resource implications should be reported to the Parliament. 
The various bodies affected by the bill can be expected to seek additional funding as a result. This will be considered as part of the usual government budget procedures, including the budget bill which Parliament scrutinises each year. Therefore, the best approach to this area is to rely on the usual budget bill process rather than to uh, invent a new and certain bespoke procedure, which frankly just seems an attempt to delay this bill. And the same concerns I raised on Amendment 4, 5 and 6 apply to this amendment too, in the uncertainty it would create over how we would actually know whether the bill is in force or not. For these reasons, I invite the committee to reject the amendment. John Finney, do you wish to comment? Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, the financial resolution procedure in the Parliament is designed to ensure that par Parliament approval of expenditures are associated with a particular bill should that amount be considered significant. In this case, no resolution was considered to be required. There is, of course, also the opportunity for the Parliament to scrutinise the Scottish Government's budget. No other examples come to mind of a bill being passed by Parliament, but then being unable to be brought into force until a financial statement has been published and subject to Parliament approval. It would be interesting to know if the member who brought forward the amendment has any examples or is... Is, um, or does the member believe there should be a new stage four for all bills, perhaps just those which he does not agree with? The financial memorandum sets out an estimated cost of the bill, and the Scottish Government has made comments about the work they are currently undertaking to prepare for the implementation of the bill. The committee heard from relevant agency, as well as from the Scottish Government, that the costs associated with the bill as drafted would not be prohibitive, and are also difficult to estimate with any certainty at the moment. The amendment also seems to presuppose that additional resources will be required. If the ministers consulted the specific uh, people and they say that the commencement of Section 1 won't in itself require any additional resources, and ministers publish a statement to that effect, and the Parliament pa passes a resolution saying it agrees with his views, does that count? It would not appear to meet... Um, uh, as it would, wouldn't be a, a resolution that the resources set out in the statement are sufficient, since the statement would not set out any additional resources. I hope you followed that, because it's about as, as straightforward as the proposal itself. I do apologise. Finally, during stage one, there seemed to be no strong view that the resourcing funding was a major issue with the bill. Indeed, the Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee only received one submission in response to its consultation on the financial memorandum to the bill. I ask committee members to vote against Amendment 7 in Oliver Mundell's name. Thank you. Okay, Oliver Mundell, to wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 7, please. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm not surprised that the member in charge of the bill didn't pay very much attention to the minority statement, uh, but certainly within that, uh, myself and Annie Wells did uh, draw attention to the fact that we had uh, concerns about drawing uh, existing resources away uh, from, from children who need support most. And that specific uh, point. I'm grateful for the member taking intervention on that point. I didn't comment on that. I was commenting on the response uh, that the Parliament's Finance and Constitution Committee received. Uh, well, with all due respect, uh, I'm, I'm not a member uh, of, of that committee. And you know, I, I, my amendment is moved uh, with a view to satisfying <coughs> uh, the concerns I had uh, in, in relation to stage one, because I'm certainly aware from my constituency work, uh, from the wider work uh, that I do in the Parliament in relation to, to children and young people, uh, that there are big pressures on resources uh, within many of the organisations listed. Um, and given uh, the fact, uh, I don't think it's a secret, uh, I, I, I don't support the general principles uh, of the bill uh, because, because of the vagaries of it and the difficulties I think it will pose. I therefore do question you know, whether or not, uh, given the, my view that the bill isn't, isn't necessary, um, that, that these organisations uh, should, we should be absolutely satisfied these organisations have the resource and that this doesn't, uh, doesn't, doesn't force them to, to change their practices. That, that's what the amendment's intended to do. Um, and I, I would like to, to push it. Thank you. The question is that amendment seven be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, be a division. Those for Amendment 7, please. And those against Amendment 7?
Step two for the amendment and five against. The amendment falls. I call amendment eight in the name of Annie Wells in a group on its own. Annie Wells to move and speak to amendment eight, please. Thank you, convener. Um, during stage one of the, the evidence, we heard from the Crown Office and the Procurator Fiscal, and we heard from them that there was limitations of data um, available. This amendment would ensure better established evidence before the bill came into force. Um, it has been clear throughout stage one and the progression of this bill that we need more data in relation to the number of cases in which the defence of reasonable chastisement is considered and have been a relevant factor. And I think for, for me this amendment is because the fact that we've been told that there is a very limited amount of data available, I do think that that in itself only serves to prove the point that we need to we need to understand more data before um, section 111 passes. Okay, um, Alex Cole Hamilton wish to come in there. Thank you, convener. Um, I, I, I partly understand why the member has brought this uh, to the table, but, but I would actually turn her own argument against her in the sense that the, the scarcity of data around the use of the legal defence of reasonable punishment is because it's barely ever used. And that is because, and this should give you comfort, or should give the member confidence, that the best interest principle, the public interest test, is always applied effectively by Crown in terms of taking cases through the courts. And we've had, I think, comfort offered to us by the Lord Advocate that this is, through his guidance, he is going to um, reassert that the best interest and public interest test will be applied before any case is taken to court. Um, and, and, and as such, we won't see legions of parents march through the courts as a result of this bill. It will just lead to that cultural shift that I believe the, the supporters of this bill around the table um, would like to see. Minister. Convener, this amendment seems fundamentally to be an attempt to delay the bill. The Scottish Government's already indicated that we do not have statistics on the use of the defence in court cases. The reason for that is that the Scottish Government Criminal Proceedings Database does not hold information relating to defences lodged in criminal trials. Our statistics are derived from data held on Criminal History System, or CHS, a central hub used for the electronic recording of information on people accused and or convicted of perpetrating a criminal act. Information relating to defences lodged is not recorded in an electronically extractable format and therefore not on the, the CHS. <laughs> Certainly. Will the minister take note of that point? Um, does the minister agree that if that um, data is, is not available and unable to be extracted, that should this amendment pass, it would mean that the whole bill would be delayed forever and therefore it would never go ahead? Absolutely. So I think that this amendment is fundamentally an attempt to delay the bill. Um, people will make a, a, guilty, a plea of guilty or not guilty at the start of a criminal case. There's no plea of justifiable assault or reasonable chastisement. More generally, the amendment refers to data on the effect of the defence and analysis of that data. And of course, that's not just about the number of times that the defence is used in court. It's also about the negative effect of the current defence of reasonable chastisement. And there is, as the committee heard, a wealth of evidence, yeah. certainly. I know, I know the Minister saying that um, the, the government doesn't have the stats and how often the defence is used, but would she accept that um, some of the evidence that we heard in committee and what Alex Cole Hamilton um, said earlier, that it's, it, it's likely that it's been used very little and actually practitioners like social workers, teachers, police officers, etc., who are dealing uh, with children day in, day out, um, rarely think about the defence when they are assessing situations? So I, would, I, I, I think what's clear is that we cannot get that data without interrogating manually all of the evidence around these cases of prosecution. So I think, it's, I think it's, um, it, it, it is undoubtedly an attempt to delay the introduction of the bill um, by putting this, if this amendment's passed. Um, 
I want to talk about the, the um, negative effect of the current defence of reasonable chastisement. Now, we received a wealth of evidence. The committee has heard a wealth of evidence about the negative impact of physical punishment on children. There are many written reports on this. Loath to, to cut you short, but I'm just conscious that I did ask people to focus on the amendments, and I know we'll all have a, an opportunity at stage three to, to make these points. So, I mean, I think that I, I was focusing on the amendment because the data um, on the effect of defence and the analysis of that data, does, I mean, I think it um, does um, talk about the the evidence around whether the defence has a negative impact on children or not. I don't think we need any more data on the effect of the defence. Reasonable chastisement, we've well established, has a negative effect. Let's remove it and let's not delay it. For those reasons, I would urge Annie Wells not to press the amendment, but if it is pressed, I would invite the committee to reject it. John Finney. We've already heard from Crown Office Procurator, Fiscal Service and the Lord Advocate that such data is not available. Therefore, it would not seem wise to legislate to require publication of data which the relevant bodies have already confirmed is not available. The amendment is also vague in its references to cases in which that rule is considered to have been a relevant factor. Considered by whom? What factors are relevant? Are cases to include incidents that were investigated, only those that were prosecuted, only those that were heard in court, over what timescales? As an example, if the police didn't record something as a crime because the PC who attended saw the, the, the smacking as an exercise of reasonable chastisement, that might count as such a case, but there wouldn't be any data about it precisely for that reason. There's also the issue of what value data would add in advance of Section 1 coming in to force if it were available. Uh, um, also, in what way it would be analysed and what value would that add? What is surely more relevant are the number of cases of assault against children that have been brought, the nature of those cases and the outcomes, which the Lord Advocate and uh, Anne-Marie Hicks, the National Procurator Fiscal for Domestic Abuse at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal uh, Service, spoke to the committee about. I ask committee members to vote against Amendment 8 in the name of Annie Wells. Thank you. Annie Wells, to um, wind up and press or withdraw Amendment 8, please. Been our, um, I would just like to clarify that this amendment was not ever meant to be a delaying tactic amendment. It was an amendment that I thought was, was relevant. Um, having heard the Lord Advocate himself say that there might be more people, um, there, might be more, there might be more increased reporting, um, I did think that we should see some evidence of that. Um, and this was about the practical effects on, on the children. So for that reason, convener, I'm going to um, press for this amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. We have division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 8 to raise their hand? And those against Amendment 8? There are two for Amendment 8 and five against. The amendment falls. The question is that Section 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed? The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. No. Okay. Um, Members um, should note that there won't be a division on this, but that their dissent to uh, the agreement will be noted, if that's acceptable. Okay, um, that concludes stage two consideration of the bill. The bill will now be reprinted as amended at stage two. The Parliament has not determined when stage three will be he held. Members will be informed of that in due course, along with the deadline for lodging stage three amendments. In the meantime, stage three amendments can be lodged with the clerks in the legislation team. Can I thank um, John Finney and officials and Minister Marie Todd and officials for attending. Um, the next meeting of the committee will be on Thursday the 27th of June when the committee will discuss its approach to female genital mutilation protection and guidance Scotland bill. We will now move into private session and I ask the public gallery to clear please.